Zika virus is um, it's transmitted by mosquitoes and it's uh, closely related to the viruses such as dengue, Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever that people may have heard of already. Well, the symptoms that Zika causes are very much similar to uh, many other viral infections, mainly like fever, rash, um, sometimes arthralgia and so on, so symptoms that are pretty generic. And then it's only really when we have, I would say, more unusual symptoms that people will probably really start taking notice. That could be microcephaly, of course, Guillain-Barré as well. Well, the situation in Brazil is, um, is complicated uh, in the sense that we're now seeing the start of the rainy season in a number of places that will, um, it's likely to increase biting activity. So we know that um, the outbreak has spread across um, many countries of um, South and Central America all the way up to Mexico and to the Caribbean. So the outbreak is really continuing and the number of cases is growing. So I went to Brazil as part of um, an MRC Newton fund funded project with a colleague at Fio Cruz in Recife. So a number of us from the University of Glasgow went, also um, a colleague Gavin Sweeten from Imperial College. There was a workshop on Zika at the same time, so we got to know um, a lot of people in addition to our collaborators. Um, it was extremely useful for us to go to see the situation on the ground, and that's really something I think that I, I need to point out that in order to understand arboviruses, it's not on many other viruses in fact as well, it's very good for people to get out and actually have a look themselves because you will understand the underlying factors and the ecology much better and that can inform your research. But um, yes, we did, we, did see, um, we did see a lot of the, the area of course, but we did go to um, IMIP, which is one of the large hospitals in Recife, where the early cases of microcephaly were in fact detected. And um, it was... Um, it was um, very important experience. There's a lot of fantastic people who do a lot of good work under difficult conditions, with under, which is one of the poorest states in Brazil, but very dedicated staff who really try to help um, pregnant women in any case, but they also now confronted with um, cases of microcephaly that are increasing, that are dramatically increasing. And um, the UK has such a strong virology base, and the same is true for Europe as well, that we, we really need to make enough, and I feel very strongly about this. We, we, I think we can make a difference, and um, I think there's a lot of goodwill out there and um, we need to give ourselves and we need to give these people the means to, to try and improve the conditions on the ground and improve the conditions in research labs, improve the conditions in hospitals and ultimately help the people. I think poverty is, um, is as so often as the case as, um, is a major player in these diseases. For example, like mosquito, mosquito breeding sites are um, an important contributor to local outbreaks and um, controlling these isn't always trivial. I mean, it sounds very easy to do, but the reality of the situation is that there can be difficulties. And we have seen that in Brazil, we've seen it in many other places as well. The problem, of course, with uh, the poorer parts of, of large cities like Recife is, um, is a lack of infrastructure. For example, if you go to the poor areas, people will have water tanks on top of their houses because they have no they have no sanitary systems otherwise. And these water tanks can be breeding sites for mosquitoes or, you know, simple flower pots at times can be breeding sites for mosquitoes, fish tanks. That's, um, I think the scale of the problem is, or the scale of the operation you have to launch is enormous. And that is something I think you will only really appreciate when you have been in these parts of the world and you can see it. On the other hand, we cannot, we cannot let go, we cannot give up on this. I mean, it's still a very important part of, um, you know, of helping. And I'm sure it will make a difference to some extent. But it is, of course, also an enormous challenge for the authorities, for the local people. And it is very sadly the case often that, of course, the poor areas are badly affected. People can't afford repellents. No, people cannot afford to just go to Europe or Canada or the US when they're pregnant. That is the reality for many of the people who live under impoverished conditions. I think what you, what you very frequently need to remind people of this, that Aedes aegypti is a very domesticated mosquito. It's not just a mosquito that uh, flies around looking for somebody to feed on, like, like just, just a, literally across the street. It's a very domesticated mosquito that is very well adapted to us. I mean, it tends to hide in, uh, in curtains, in clothing, in like crevices, in houses. And um, it's not a very good flyer. Um, so it is very much adapted to us. There is an ancestral form of the mosquito, which is the, the wild Aedes aegypti, the way it's um, in selvatic form as it still exists in Central Africa. 
but um, the domesticated form, which is the disease vector, is very much adapted to us. It's really a case of like um, almost a poodle becoming the wolf, if you want. I mean, the mosquito is, um, is preferentially biting humans, which is not the case for other edile mosquitoes, for example, like Aedes albopictus, which have also been implied as, um, as vectors of arboviruses. But Aedes albopictus has different breeding habits. It doesn't as easily feed on humans. And Aedes aegypti is really uh, the major issue for many of these arbovirus diseases. Well, this is very, a very tricky one because the theoretical um, solution will, of course, be to use, uh, use repellents, prevent, um, prevent biting, clean up, uh, don't have any standing waters. But even places like Singapore, which are very highly developed, which have very um, potent and very strongly enforced vector control programs, are finding this an issue. So you can imagine in poorer regions of the world. And um, so the advice given to people who travel to these regions, of course, is to avoid mosquito bites and use repellents and so on. But thinking about the people on the ground, of course, yes, the same, apply, the same advice to some extent applies, but it's, it's not always easy to implement when you're living under these conditions. I think there's a, there's a very large scale effort at this moment to um, bring a lot of people together to find different ways of dealing with Zika that involves people who are involved in public health, people who are involved in vaccines, um, antivirals, vector control, and so on. There's a, in, in some ways, there's a, there's, a, there's a very much pioneering spirit almost. To, um, I, I think people feel that they, they can make a difference, but I think at the same time, we realize it's not going to be easy. But all these different efforts will be pursued, I think, very vigorously by a number of organizations and scientists and universities in the future because we are, we are facing what is really a very, very big problem here. And um, I think we all realize that is the case.